Terry Parsons. I'm the president of the Oklahoma Numismatic Association. Uh, we're a, a, a statewide group in Oklahoma that has about 190 members. Uh, we're having our fall show in Tulsa today and uh, I usually do educational programs at our conventions. Uh, we're, uh, we're having a good show so far. We're about halfway through it. Um, my program today is going to be on collecting barber dimes. Uh, most collectors use, need a spark to get them engaged in some kind of a putting a set together and mine started when I was about 12 years old in Duncan, Oklahoma. Uh, my brother and I had paper routes and we collected every month for the paper and at that time this would have been early 50s uh, mostly it was uh, Roosevelt dimes and mercury dimes that were in circulation. The last barber dime was made in 1916, so it had been quite a while. Uh, so you rarely ever saw one. Anyway, I got one in my my chain uh, on collecting. It, as I remember, it was a worn out 1907D. <laughs> and my brother was jealous <laughs> that I found it so that made it even better. <laughs> you know? So anyway, uh, uh, that sparked my interest kind of in Barber Dimes. Uh, I didn't have a whole lot of money then and uh, sure couldn't have afforded to put together a very good set if I could even find them. Uh, we collected mostly out of circulation. So uh, sometime in the late 60s I bought an album in an auction uh, that was a Barber Dime album that had a few coins in it. And so at that time, I started trying to put the set together. Uh, I was generally buying low grade, inexpensive ones, you know, to fill holes. Uh, the set, by the way, has 75 in it, so it's not a small set. It's got a lot of dimes, and it's got several stoppers, <laughs> you know, you could say that would keep anybody unless you had deep pockets from ever completing it. So I slowly picked up more and more over the years. Sometime after 2000, my, my fortunes improved a little bit. I decided to com complete it. So uh, I, I could never have afforded the Key Day 94S. A lot of people don't consider it part of the series anyway. There's only a handful of them known. And they're million dollar coins when they hit the market. Uh, but the 95 0 is your, 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 it's your big key that's the people can afford. I think that was the last coin I bought at that time to complete the set. And I, as I recall, I paid $500 for it. It was a good, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, after completing the set and waiting about seven or eight years, I moved on to other, other collections. Uh, I decided to come back to it and try to complete it in VF or better. Now that really starts to be a challenge because some, there, there's hot, not hardly any in, at some dates, you know, that are that nice. Q. David Bowers wrote a book on Barber Dimes uh, about, it was published 10 years ago or so. That's the basis for what I'm talking about today from a technical standpoint. But he estimated in that book that 95% of the Barber Dimes that exist today are goods or below. So that's how tough it is to start finding them, you know, BF, which has got a full liberty in the headband. Uh, so that was a challenge that I worked on three or four years. My fortunes had improved so I could afford better coins. But uh, most people would have thought the 95-0 and some of those tougher dates were the last ones I would acquire. 
but it was a 97S, which is kind of a better date, but it's not, you know, considered a key or even a semi-key. Uh, the 97S, I, it was just hard for me to find one that was decent. Well, what happened uh, in the early 20th century in San Francisco that might have created the shortage of some uh, uh, San Francisco made barber dimes? Yes. Maybe there was an earthquake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was an earthquake and it practically burned down the town. About the only thing that survived was the mint. And it was a better made, you know, masonry building and it survived. But how, I wonder how many dimes melted during that earthquake and the aftermath of the earthquake. So that, that explains some more maybe about San Francisco made ones that makes them a little rare and harder to find. Anyway, um, that's kind of uh, uh, the brief story of how I got serious about Barber Dimes. So I've gone through an early stage, uh, middle stage, and finally uh, upgrade to very fines and better. Uh, I completed that probably about seven or eight years ago. Uh, so they've sat in the vault and uh, I pull them out from time to time to admire them. And recently I decided to do some programs. So I've been doing these for some of the clubs around the state of Oklahoma for a while. And uh, anyway, let's talk about the dimes in a little greater detail. Uh, my type coin, which is by far my best dime, is uh, 92, first year of issue, made at Philadelphia. They're pretty available, particularly circulated ones. Uh, mine is uh, uh, Mint State 65 in a PCGS holder with a green bean, if you know what a green bean. Another grading service actually looks at the grades on PCGS and NGC slab coins and they make an, do an opinion on whether it's, it's a plus or, or better for the grade. And this one has one. Uh, so it's a near perfect barber dime. I'm gonna circulate it around if that's okay. So anyway, uh, other good dates in the series uh, include the 95. I have one in a XF45 holder. And uh, a lot of your early dates, particularly if they have mint marks on them, are better. But that's an example of a Philadelphia that's better. Uh, what was going on in, from 93 until about 96 in this country, probably wouldn't know, but we were having a recession, a depression. So what happens? Many just drop, <laughs> even in Philadelphia. <laughs> so uh, lower managers result in being less available, which makes them tougher dates. But the big key in the Barber Dime series is the 95-0. It was made in New Orleans. Uh, it was a very low manage. I think the 13S is the only one with a lower manage, but uh, besides the 94S. <laughs> but um, but it was earlier and and they're less available. Um, to give you a reference point of how pricey some of these can be, I think I paid $3,000 for this. <laughs> Back when I, I think I bought it from one of the national dealers. <laughs> At a Chicago uh, a and show. All of the 96s are better. Who's on the barber? Who is? Okay, it's a depiction of Liberty. Uh, okay. 
Charles Barber developed the series. I probably should have explained that a little bit. So I'll backslide this a little bit here. And uh, Charles Barber was the son of William Barber that was a, a man engraver that was, they kind of recruited from England. Uh, he served in the eight, late 1860s and about 1878 or nine. He died. His son had been working for him at the Mint for about 10 years. That was Charles. So he was raised, really, kind of at, as an engraver by his dad at the Mint. He got the job, and he served. He was one of the longest, I guess he was the longest uh, engraver that ever served. He served until 1916 when he died. But... Uh, we had had seated liberty dimes in the, most of the 19th century. And uh, we had a new mint director that came in and he wanted to change. And so they first tried to put it out to private uh, artists. Uh, they reviewed several requests from the private sector. None of them measured up. So they turned to Charles <laughs> to, to make the design for them. And back then, every coin, silver coin, had the same design on the obverse. Some of them had a, the dimes in particular had different reverses. But uh, so in 19, 1918-92, they came out with the dimes, the quarters, and the halves, all with the same obverse. The dime was different. The quarter and the half has a heraldic eagle on them, which was kind of typical back then for some of your larger coins. So that's the brief kind of history of how they were developed. Uh, right now, I was... I've got a 96 uh, Philadelphia up there. The uh, 96s, they, the managers were still low. Uh, the 96O and the 96S are both tough dates. They're better dates. They're not really considered to be keys, but they're kind of semi-keys, I guess you'd say. Uh, I'm going through my certified coins first. Uh, my other ones are in an album. The uh, 97S I mentioned briefly earlier. I find it took me a year to find a decent 97S. It was, I think the coin is probably undervalued. I think they're rarer than, than many think they are. Uh, so if you find a VF or better 97S, I would snap it up if it didn't have problems, you know, and uh, you'd probably buy it at a reasonable price. Uh, we don't really get into any more key dates until uh, we get in after 1900. Well, the 97O is a better. It's a semi-key. But uh, the next coin that's a, it's a stopper for a lot of people is the O1S, my, again made in San Francisco. Most of these are going to be made in San Francisco, we know the reason. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, the O1S uh, that's in my album is a VF. It's got a full liberty. It's, uh, it's, it's in the book. And, but it's raw. Some of these I could have sent in, but I was still doing albums <laughs> back when I was working on these. And just be careful when you're buying a, a raw coin. Make sure it's real and make sure that it's properly graded, particularly if it's over a couple of hundred dollars in value. But the next key date that I have certified is the 03S. And it is in a VF 
25 holder NGC. Uh, again, uh, tough date, uh, two or three hundred dollars in value, at least in VF. Uh, VF is a wide range, so as you start to move up that range into the VF 35s, they get closer to XF values. I'm going to put up a few other uh, certified coins. Uh, I buy them in annex holders. Uh, I've got a couple here in annex holders. They usually uh, do a good job of grading their coins and authenticating them. Uh, they don't get quite as much respect in the marketplace as PCGS and and NGC just figure about 10% less in value if you put them in an auction or, or try to sell them uh, at a show. Uh, but I like them. If, if you're a good grader and you can grade coins, it really doesn't matter, even if you buy them in those off-brand holders. But so many in the off-brand holders are way overgraded, so, so you need to be careful if you go down that road. Show you a couple more. This is a 1900S. Now you're starting to see some uh, better. It's not quite as tough, but it's in an AU55 holder. So you're getting close to mint state on these. And they should have some luster and uh, should look nice. The last certified coin I have is a 1907S. Uh, it's in a PCGS holder, and it's a XF40. And uh, XF, these, probably my whole set is close to XF on average. Uh, seemed like I was doing some numbers, and I had uh, 17 that were AU to UNC, and nine that were VFs, 47 that were VFs. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's tilted certainly toward the XF, more the XF range. Uh, What's the there's, best place to find your coins? Uh, you're, when you get into these big sets, you're going to find them at a range of places. Uh, there's a lot of national dealers JJ Tea Party, I bought some from them. I bought some from, uh, uh, oh, who's, there's one in California. I can't think of the name of it right now, but it seemed like it's initials, L and C or something like that. But, uh, but usually I like to look at my coins at shows. I buy the majority of my coins at shows but I go to a range of shows. I'm a district rep for A&A, &A, so I make a lot of the World Fair of Coin shows that they do. Uh, by the way, they got one, I think they're gonna hopefully be able to do it in Arizona, and uh, I think it's March. Anyway, uh, so I bought a fair number at A and A shows. I bought a fair number at uh, at shows in Oklahoma. Uh, higher grade ones are less available. So sometimes you have to, if you're into the VFs or better, you you're probably gonna, may have to go to more of the bigger shows. I do A and A summer seminar every year. I have for about. 20 years with a few exceptions. They have a big show in Colorado Springs while that's going on each year in June. And uh, I bought some of my coins up there. What's neat about that show is that the summer seminar brings in a lot of national dealers that do teach the programs there. And so uh, you can kill two birds with one stone. You can, you can, uh, go to a great educational experience at Colorado College in Colorado Springs and then t between weeks you can take a go to a good show <laughs> and maybe find some coins. 
that answer your question? Uh, any other questions? I've enjoyed collecting Barber dimes. I've probably spent more time on them than, than the average. I started young and kind of stayed hooked up off and on through the years. And I'm 77 now, and uh, I've had a great life in the hobby, and uh, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. Good. <laughs> I'd be glad to answer any questions if anybody has any. What's the best kind of holder you've got? A That's an old yeah. Whitnam. It's an old blue Whitnam. <laughs> Is there a oh, oh, uh, Well, I can't remember exactly uh, when I, I, I got this one. I think it was while I was in that middle, you know, still just trying to put the set together <laughs> that I just kept using it after I would take the you know the lower grade ones out put the the better grade ones in as I acquired them and, and of course I had to start acquiring many you know that were certified but okay. there's better are... there's better holders the probably the Dansko or you know they're higher quality and whipping them now is making some that's got uh, better, you know, they're heavier. They're, they're just heavier stock material in them. Key dates. Mm -hmm. what, is that like when they start and end and just low mintage? Is that what a key Well, there's is? a number of reasons of why key dates exist, what are considered keys. It really starts mostly with, re they just didn't make many to start with. So they were, were rare to start with. Now we've talked about some today that that uh, is may, maybe got rare because of some event that happened, you know, in their area or where they were being made. And, uh, you know, San Francisco earthquake's a good example of what happened in the Barbers. But you'll find that in other series. It, uh, but the other big factor other than manage is uh, did they circulate a lot? Did the coin for whatever reason? Uh, I'm gonna use a Morgan dollar uh, or two example. 1884 S Morgan do dollars are condition rarities. They, uh, you can buy a common one worn out for 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. But boy, when it gets F, X, X or better, they start quickly escalating in price. And mint state ones are like $140,000 or something. Thing. Well, what was going on in Philadelphia? I mean, in San Francisco, San Francisco again. You right. know? Well, Sorry. nobody collected. It was out on the West Coast, miles away from any collector base which was mainly in the east so they just circulated like crazy and see they carried them out there they used them in commerce now, silver dollars were hardly even used on the east coast they were bank reserves and, and bagged and, and, and put in vaults you know so the west was different you know they liked hard money and and so everything circulate. But the 84S is a condition rarity. There's a lot of other uh, Morgan dollars that are like that. Uh, a lot of them got wore out and melted. 